All of us have had some experience uh, involved in uh, some aspect of restoration. If you have had a favorite automobile you're trying to restore, a piece of furniture or some personal memento, maybe you're even involved in, a, in trying to restore an entire house and get it back to pristine condition. The success, however, is dependent on how closely we follow the original pattern of the item in question as to whether or not we really restore it. For example, a restorer who is a purist and he wants to restore a 56 Ford Thunderbird will not introduce parts from other vehicles or other makes and models uh, to simply uh, act as a stopgap. He will not be satisfied with uh, using parts from a Cadillac or a, a Buick Road, Roadmaster or something like that. He has to have 56 Ford Thunderbird parts and he may scour the country contacting all sorts of uh, businesses and uh, junkyards and uh, places that specialize in these type of things in order to find the parts that he needs uh, to complete the restoration project. You may have a favorite piece of uh, jewelry. My wife uh, recently had a uh, piece that we had bought in Taiwan that's over 30 something years of age now technically considered an antique. She's been trying to find some way to restore it to its original luster and things of that nature. And she has had very little success. Most of them tell, tell her that we just don't have the, the wherewithal to do what they did in Taiwan to produce the particular piece in question. And so uh, we still continue to look uh, for a jeweler who has that ability and has the tools and uh, the other things necessary but uh, to get it back to its original condition. The, uh, and this is just what we do. If we are seeking to fully, completely restore something, if we are to be what people of the first century A.D. were, those who wholly and faithfully followed Christ, and we can know who they are by reading the scriptures concerning them, then we need to become what they were and practice what they practiced. If we believe and practice what they believed and practiced, then that will imply that, or that implies, that we are what they were. And uh, that's the basic principle stated. The matter of the restoration principle is seen throughout the Bible. Uh, in fact, the New Testament calls upon us to abide very carefully by the words of the New Testament. Jesus, for example, when he uh, sent out his disciples in Matthew chapter 19, or in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 28, said uh, in verse 19 that uh, you're to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching, uh, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, watch it, whatsoever I have commanded you. And by the way, that includes Matthew 19, verse 9. That would include everything that Jesus taught is to be taught today. And uh, we need to uh, be careful that, and see that that is to be done. And the authority behind it was to last until the end of the world. That is uh, the, the scope of that mission. And he said, lo, I am with you even until the end of the world. The I own, the age. The Jews spoke of, of, of the age and by the way the Greeks did too 
They spoke of the present age and they spoke of the age which is to come. And uh, Professor Sass, Sasse, actually, is how you would pronounce his name, Sasse, and uh, uh, Professor uh, Burton, uh, Edward Burton, both noted that in those phrases the idea is the present age uh, is concomitant with the existence of the present physical universe. As long as this world exists, this physical world, cosmos exists, it is, we are living in the present age. When that ceases, then we have the age which is to come. And that's exactly how this, this terminology is used in the New Testament, by the way. And so when Jesus says, unto the end of the age, he is talking about until the end of this physical universe, ultimately. Because that time span is concomitant with the existence of this universe. Anyway, other passages stress the need to abide by biblical, particularly New Testament authority. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, a passage we've all uh, heard uh, on numerous occasions. If any man speak, let him speak as what? The oracles of God. What, he, what God has said. In fact, Jesus himself said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. And so this is the basis, the foundational principle uh, for restorationism. The restoration principle upon which uh, the restoration movement was based is seen in the Old Testament scriptures especially. We see that principle played out over and over again uh, either uh, by the use of direct statements urging the people to go back to the pattern of things established under the law of Moses by examples of godly men who sought to do that very thing and by implications based on the nature of the blessings and benefactions that God uh, would give the people if they abided by his word. He promised, if you go back to my truth, go back to my word, do what my law says, and keep in mind at that time it would be the law of Moses, would be the, the, the principal uh, authoritative uh, uh, basis or standard, if they went back to that, God would bless them. And he, re he uh, says that over and again. Now, the plea for restoration has been around for many years. In fact, not long after the apostles had passed away. Uh, and apostasy had uh, set in in various parts of uh, the ancient world at that time among some of the churches, there were those who periodically would uh, plea among the writers of the uh, post-apostolic period who would uh, plea for going back to the writings of the apostles and the sayings of Jesus. And we need to be governed by these and nothing else. Over the years, when you got to the Reformation movement, there were various Reformation leaders that periodically said the same thing. Ulrich Zwingli, in particular, was one who advocated really a return to the Bible as the sole authority. Periodically, uh, Martin Luther would claim to believe that, but uh, then turn around and contradict himself with some of his own declarations. But Zwingli, and I've often wondered how things might have turned out if Zwingli had survived longer and outlived Luther instead of the other way around, what effect that might have had upon European history and particularly the religious history of those nations. Uh, John Calvin can be quoted in some places as supporting a return to the scriptures. And yet at the same time, 
uh, much of what Calvin uh, wrote and said uh, went on to be the basis of various confessions of faith and, uh, and other documents that uh, creeds that men uh, appeal to, uh, oftentimes even over Bible authority. But in the late 18th century in England, in uh, Ireland and in Scotland, there was a movement. Uh, in fact, it actually began uh, earlier than that in Scotland and Ireland uh, to uh, go back to the scriptures. Certain denominational preachers began teaching and admonishing their members. We need to use the scriptures uh, as the sole basis of authority and they began to swear off the use of uh, creeds and catechisms and manuals and things of men of that nature. In the United States or in the colonies uh, and ultimately in the United States a movement arose particularly in the Northeast uh, under Abner Jones and Elias Smith calling for a return to the scriptures. Down in Virginia uh, a man by the name of James O'Kelly uh, even sought control over the Methodist Church uh, in, with the intent ultimately of dissolving uh, the uh, Methodist system of government and going to independent uh, churches, congregations that would be governed by the Bible only. Let's get, get away from the Methodist discipline was one of the things he advocated. And, uh, the, and so in Virginia and Maryland and North Carolina, you had a number of churches that called themselves churches of Christ. And uh, even to this day, and they are known as O'Kelly churches. We had a few of those in our area when I was preaching in uh, Newport News, Virginia. Uh, visited one of the meeting houses that uh, was uh, referred to as an O'Kelly church. Beautiful, ornate building. And uh, O'Kelly was trying to get them to leave the Methodist church, and some of them did. And uh, they ceased to call themselves Methodists. Uh, Barton Warren Stone in uh, Kentucky, in the Ohio River Valley around 1800, 1801, and thereafter... Uh, was advocating a change and again going back to the scriptures and let's strike hands across the Bible and be united on it and it alone. Of course Thomas and Alexander Campbell in the next decade following uh, picked up around actually around 1807 and then 1809 but really not until uh, 1811 in that time frame were they fully moving uh, toward full restoration that they were wanting to uh, advocate. And then eventually uh, those who had been influenced by Stone and those who were influenced by Campbell came together and began to work and cooperate together toward that very end. They understood that we must abide by the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, verse 27, and be governed by that. Well, looking at the Old Testament itself, uh, concerning this principle, let's consider uh, a few things. First, think about the matter of these direct statements that are given in exhortations to return to the divine pattern uh, that existed under the law of Moses. Numerous exhortations were given by God to his people under the old law to return to it and begin to do what he had commanded them and their fathers. A classic example is the appeal that God makes through the prophet Jeremiah for Judah to return again to me, saith the Lord, Jeremiah 3.1, in order that uh, they might restore the spiritual relationship that existed with God. Uh, that relationship is portrayed in Jeremiah 3 as a marriage. 
God said, I married you. And he did marry them, spiritually speaking, at Mount Sinai and the law itself being the equivalent to the Jewish ketubah that they were to abide by, they were to accept and be governed according. Uh, the Jewish ketubah, by the way, uh, is a binding document very, in, in a Jewish marriage, very serious matter. Uh, and it states the, the obligations of both parties uh, quite uh, specifically to one another. And uh, God's ketubah, as it were, his special covenant uh, of marriage was the law of Moses. God loved Israel and Judah, but both had turned through idolatry to spiritual harlotry. Jeremiah 3, verses 6 through 11. They had become unfaithful, and so God divorced them for their infidelity. And that's what Jeremiah is dealing with in that chapter. He uh, points out, that my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. Judah played the harlot, he says. Jeremiah 3, verse 6. Listen to his indictment. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 3, verse 20. This Hebrew word translated treacherously involves the idea of treason. You've committed treason against me. You have committed treason. And uh, similarly, the husband who unscripturally divorced his wife in Malachi 2 is spoken of as having committed treason against her, being treacherous. And that's how God looked at that marriage relationship and the same with his relationship with Israel. In conjunction with their idolatry, there were also the sins of the murder of innocence and the sexual immorality that went with their religion and their general behavior. Oh, we don't have any trouble with either of those in this country, do we? You ever heard of abortion? The former was from the sacrifice of children to the fire gods of the Moabites and the Ammonites, Jeremiah 7, verse 31. The latter was due to the immorality that often attended both pagan worship and lifestyles. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 5, 8, they were as fed horses in the morning. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. They, had, they placed no limits on their behavior. This even included the sexual perversions of sodomy and prostitution. But God pled with his people to return to him and his law. Jeremiah 3 verse 12 and other verses. But they refused to return. Nehemiah, years later, summarized how the people had disrespected and disobeyed God's word. Listen to Nehemiah 9, verse 30. Yet many years didst thou forbear and testify against them by thy servants the prophets, yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the peoples of the land. God desired their restoration to him and the relationship that he had established under the law, but they persisted in their sin. His prophets rose early, stayed until late, seeking to call the people back to God, but they would not return. In the book of Hosea, we see a very poignant picture of God's appeal to his wife, his spiritual bride, to return to him and be a faithful wife to him, as the law demanded. He told Hosea to go marry a woman of whoredom. Gomer was that woman. Hosea 1, verses 2 and following. She persisted in her illicit behavior despite the love that Hosea showed for her, despite his care and concern. 
His sorrow and pain that came out of that relationship reflected that of Jehovah God for Israel and her spiritual adultery. Just as Hosea's heart was broken because of Gomer's behavior, so God's was breaking because of the behavior of his sinful nation. He even uh, bought her back out of her uh, har uh, harlotry to foreshadow God's redeeming Israel from their coming captivity. Hosea 3 verses 1 through 5. God loved Israel just as Hosea loved Gomer. And it was heartbreaking. The people were destroyed for their ignorance of God's word, their rejection of his knowledge. Hosea 4 verse 6. And Israel played the harlot, Hosea 4.15. Just as Hosea pleaded with his wife to return and amend her ways, so God pleaded through the same prophet among others. One was Amos, the same time, the country preacher. But he pled with them to return. And he said that he would bind them up, Hosea 6, verse 1. But the whoredom of Ephraim defiled her, Hosea 6, verse 10, and she persisted in it to her own destruction. Despite that, God pleaded with her to return to be restored to him as a faithful wife. Jeremiah sets out the pattern for return very succinctly in Jeremiah 6, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Well, the old paths were laid out in the law of Moses. That's where they could find the old paths. Go back to the law. Go back to what Moses said in uh, Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, Numbers. Go back to the Old Testament text. Apply these passages. Uh, restore these things and practice them. Ask for the old past, where is the good way, and walk therein. And the Hebrew stresses the idea of continuing action. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. What's of interest to us today in our own nation? We have a lot of people who profess to believe in God. Uh, I know the number of the those, excuse me, is dropping, that there are less people professing to believe in God than even 10 years ago, that the number has dropped uh, precipitously in that regard. But still, the majority of the American people claim to believe in God. But if you add to that, how many of you believe in the Bible as the Word of God, the inspired, all-sufficient, uh, inerrant Word, that number drops even more. How do they claim to follow a God that they have no revelation from? Or at least uh, they claim they have no revelation from. It is absurd. One of the things that you get into with people, they'll say, well, I believe in Jesus. Then turn around and cuss like a sailor. And my apologies to some sailors, because I know there are some that don't cuss. But uh, there, are, there are people that will do that. I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe what the Bible says. Well, then you don't really believe in Jesus. Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and doeth not the things that I say? Well, how do we know what he said? It's in the Bible. It's in the Word. And so you can't claim to believe in Jesus and yet reject his word and be consistent. Numerous exhortations. In Proverbs 22, verse 28, Remove not the ancient landmark, that is the boundary mark, which thy fathers have set. We have boundary marks all over the place in the word of God. And people are removing them every day, ignoring them. Then there are examples of godly men who tried to return to the divine pattern. You think about uh, the case of Ezra. And we, you can read that material. We go through quite a few examples. But uh, when they returned from the Babylonian captivity, there were three stages. 
The first stage began in 536 B.C. under the direction of Zerubbabel, uh, who was a sign of the house of David, and Jeshua the high priest. They sought to restore the temple and its environs and, and begin the work trying to restore the city of Jerusalem. The second stage was directed by Ezra the ready scribe, who was authorized by an edict of Artaxerxes Longimanus in 458 B.C. His purpose was to restore the law of Moses, the teaching of the law. The third stage was directed by Nehemiah, the cupbearer, uh, to Artaxerxes I. He was authorized to go back and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and subsequently Jerusalem itself to complete that work. This is without doubt the same edict that's contemplated in the prophecy of Daniel 70 weeks, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. It was a restoration of the city, and it was successful. Herodotus, uh, writing around 400 B.C., visited the city of Jerusalem and spoke of how it was a, a beautiful city and fully uh, functioning, the, the walls and uh, the, the streets were filled with children and uh, everything was uh, gay and happy there. They, they had a happy life in that time. In Ezra's return, there was uh, a return to the proper standard. They pushed and pressed that the word of the Lord was to be the basis of it. Ezra 1 verse 1. They went back to Jerusalem Ezra 1 verse 2, which is where the law was to go, uh, was to be established and the name of the Lord was to be uh, established again in the temple that was re rebuilt there. The work of Ezra also involved the proper purpose to restore the knowledge of God to Israel and of his word and through them then to the world and to ultimately then prepare for the coming of the Messiah and the New Testament age. We could say a whole lot more about the restoration that took place under Ezra, and he succeeded. The law was restored. And one of the things that stands out, if you read intertestament history, one of the things that stands out is despite the problems that they did have and that did arise from time to time, Idolatry was no longer one of them. They learned their lesson in that regard. Thank you.